morning, everybody. Welcome to Jubilee Circle this morning. Welcome to everybody who is in the building. Welcome to everyone out there in uh, YouTubeville joining us this morning. Ready? To start. <laughs> Ready? One, two, three, four. God loves everyone like a mother loves her son. No strings at all, unconditional, never one to judge, would never hold a grudge about what's been done. God loves everyone. There are heaven, everyone gets in, we're all straight, souls of every faith, hell is in our minds, hell is in this life, but when it's gone, God takes every It's love is like a womb, it's like the air from the room, it surrounds us all, the living and the dead, may we never lose the thread that bound us all, oh the killer in his cell, the the pure of heart and the wild at heart all worthy of its grace it's written in the face of everyone God loves everyone there's no need to be saved, no need to be afraid, cause when it's done, God takes everyone, God loves everyone, oh yeah, I first heard that song at a church in Ottawa, Canada, I thought I was preaching at many years ago, 2009 maybe, and I said, well, y'all don't need me. <laughs> you just preach the sermon, so <laughs> let's go to lunch. So, <laughs> uh, Great, great, great song there. Um, all right, so welcome everybody to Jubilee Circle. We thank you for joining us again, uh, whether you're joining us via uh, YouTube or whether you're here in the building. We're so happy that you're joining us this morning, and we are continuing our Via Transformativa theme. Yes, and I'm glad uh, that Jessica's here, and we're going, we're going to say something to you in a minute. Uh, we're continuing our Via Transformativa theme of Barriers Be Gone. A Course in Miracles tells us that our task is not to search for love, but to tear down all the barriers that we build up to block that love. And so we're going to be exploring some of those barriers this quarter and how we can remove them. All right, so one thing we need to take care of before we move on is that it is Jessica's birthday today. How old yeah. are you, Jess? Uh, 35? All right. So let's sing, let's sing happy birthday to Jess. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jessica. Yes, that's you. Happy birthday. And many, many more. <laughs> Woo! All right, and she's got her sparkly hat on this morning. She is ready. And her in her birthday dress, she is ready. She's ready to party. All right. Author Jared Hughes paints a picture of God as good old Uncle George. He describes God as an old family relative that our parents have described to us as very loving, 
a great friend of the family, very powerful and interested in all of us. And this good old Uncle George, he lives in this formidable mansion, Hughes writes, and he's bearded and gruff and threatening. So at the end of your first visit with good old Uncle George, he tells us, I want to see you here once every week. And if you fail to come, let me show you what will happen to you. And so he leads us down into the bowels of the mansion where it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And we hear these unearthly screams emanating from the basement. And when we get down there, Uncle George opens a set of steel doors and it reveals an array of blazing furnaces with little demons tossing men, women, and children into the fire. Those who disobey good old Uncle George. And then he takes us back upstairs and gives us back to our parents who ask us on the way home, don't you just love, oh, good old Uncle George, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and all your strength, and we, loathing the monster we had just met, we say, yes, 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 I do. Because to say anything else would be joining the queue into that blazing furnace. This is the image of God that I grew up with. And perhaps many of you as well had a good old Uncle George who you had to toe the line, go to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, and seven days a week during revivals. <laughs> <laughs> or God would throw you, good old Uncle George would throw you into that furnace. This is one of the barriers I had to remove. <laughs> to be able to see the truth about God, not as some anthropomorphic monster, but as that loving creative force in this universe that invites us to participate in its unconditional love as the light of the world. So I invite you this morning, jubilance, to think about your own images of God throughout your life, how they may or may not have changed over those years. Are your images of God a barrier to you? Are they preventing you from feeling the creative, unconditional love of your creator? Then today, if that is the case, we will say, barrier be gone. And we will reclaim the truth about ourselves and God so we can all say, oh yeah. Please rise as you're able. And as we do at every celebration, we begin by remembering the four elements, the air and the water and the earth and the fire. And we burn black sage as a reminder to set our intentions, to set our intention for ourselves, for peace and joy and love and safety for ourselves, and peace and joy and love and safety for the entire world. And we, and we begin by centering ourselves in this sacred space and time by calling the four directions. And Allison's going to help me. <laughs> with the sage this morning, I invite you to turn and face the east. As this day begins, Holy One, may we give deep thanks for simply being alive, for the ability to breathe deeply. <sighs> Help us to recognize the holiness in each moment of this day, Holy One. And remind us to greet everyone, every creature, and every part of your creation with joy and thanksgiving, knowing that everyone and everything we see this day is infused with your divine energy and presence. Quarter turn to the right, and we face the south. As the warmth of the south rises and the summer months begin to draw close, remind us, Holy One, to live in love and compassion for all humankind. Help us to walk our path with joy, with love for ourselves, for others, for the four-legged, the winged ones, the plants, and all creation upon Mother Earth. Quarter turn to the right, we face the west. As each day passes, Holy One, help us to surrender with grace the things that don't work in our lives anymore. Help us to hear your voice in the quiet as another day ends and find that serenity and comfort that you offer. Give us your discernment so we can make wise choices in all things that are put in front of us. Teach us, Holy One, how to truly live in a state of surrender. Quarter turn to the right and we face the north. Be with us, Holy One. Bring healing to the people that we love and to ourselves. Bring into balance the physical and mental and spiritual so we are able to know our place on this earth, both in life 
and in eternity. Heal our bodies, heal our minds, Holy One, and bring light and joy and awareness to our spirits. And as we turn back toward the center and have a look around the room, you're going to find all of the beautiful faces, all the myriad faces of God surrounding you. We are all one spirit, having many embodied experiences in this world, each encountering our own specialized curriculum that is designed to help us all awaken to the one truth about ourselves. We are here to learn, yes, but we are also here to love and help one another during these challenging times and rejoice with one another in our joyful times, all so we can all say together, oh, yeah. All right. Remain standing. Allison is still passing out the, the good sage mojo out there. <laughs> Thank you, Allison, for helping out. That helps us a great deal. Don't lose that mojo. <laughs> yeah, we take it from afar, you know. <laughs> All right, so we've got some uh, kinks to start us off this morning. This is a song called God's Children, and I invite you during this song, greet one another, do some dancing, have a good time. Are we ready? Almost. Almost. All right. <laughs> ready? One, two, three, four. The buildings that reach to the sky And man made the motor car And learned how to fly But he didn't make the flowers And he didn't make the trees And he didn't make you Got no right to turn us into machines. No, he's got no right at all. Cause we are all God's children, and they got no right to change us. Oh, we gotta go back to the way the good Lord made us all. song that's just amazing <laughs> all right <laughs> want to hear it again 
All right, so uh, welcome again to Jubilee Circle. Just telling you a little bit about us this morning. We are an inclusive, progressive interfaith community here in Columbia, South Carolina. We teach the timeless common wisdom of love and unity that is found in all mainstream religions, metaphysical philosophies, mysticism, and inspired secular and religious writers throughout the ages. We use popular music, like a good old kink song that no one's ever heard. <laughs> it's one of those really deep tracks from the kinks. Uh, we uh, use teachings and weekly celebrations, educational and artistic events, and other community building activities as we seek to create a space here in Columbia, South Carolina and around the world so people can experience transformation so they can become a source of transformation in the world themselves. We believe that we're all here to expand our souls, to find a deeper meaning in life, to renew our commitment to love and peace and justice and learn how to love wastefully and undergo a transformation from the inside out so we can discover how to live into our higher divine self. And we also recognize we're part of God's good creation. We are formed in stardust and also in love and joy. But we humans, we're a forgetful sort. We come out of mama and we get smacked and we just forget all about it. We think there's separation, that you're over here and I'm over here and they're over there and they can stay over there. <laughs> and so we believe uh, that we're separate. And so then we start making judgments and getting grievances against one another. And so we look out in this world and they go, uh, and we say, oh, they're beautiful. Oh, they're ugly. Oh, they're good. Oh, they're bad. Oh, they're so generous. Those people are so stingy and those people are so loving. And those people, oh, those people, those people are just recalcitrant. <laughs> we got to do it all together. Yeah, recalcitrant. Recalcitrant, yes. Obstreperous, refractory, belligerent. belligerent. Yes, all of those judgments and grievances. But let us remember, jubilance, our true function here is to be the light of the world, to continually remember that that's who we are and that we have never actually left our unity with one another and our creator, and that should make you say, oh, oh yeah. yeah. All right, so next Sunday, it's April already, kids. Wow. Where is 2022 going? All right, so we're going to continue our Barriers Be Gone via Transformativa theme, and we're going to use some music from Dave Matthews. <laughs> ah, she's got it. There you go. All right, so we're going to explore the barrier of abundance. So we're looking at things that we don't think are barriers, this, this quarter, but they can be when the ego gets a hold of them and just gives it a little twist. All right, so, and then the next Sunday, April 10th, um, I'm, it will be Palm Sunday, uh, but I'm not going to be here. Michael Brazell is going to be our guest speaker. Uh, he's an interfaith minister, um, a master intuitive healer, and a grief guide, and he's going to lead us in how to build our own personal rituals and how to, we, can, we can come up with meaningful ways to connect to ourselves and connect to each other and our creator. And I saw him do this in a workshop, and it's fabulous. It's very interactive. You guys are going to love it. It's right up Jubilee's alley. So <laughs> that will be not this coming Sunday, but next Sunday, the 10th. Um, and then Sunday, April 24th, right after celebration, we're going to uh, have uh, Potluck and Learn. So uh, main courses will be provided. Um, and so if you want to come and uh, bring some side dishes and some desserts, uh, some beverages, even if you can't bring anything, come and eat and enjoy and have a good time as we listen to uh, Dr. Philip Michaels talk about God's gift of consciousness that he says is available to us at all times and we are the ones who choose whether or not to be in that higher consciousness. So we're going um, to we're gonna listen to him uh, give us a talk while we eat and have a really good time. Um, and also, we are starting, because everybody wants to have interfaith conversations, people want to know about um, other faiths, so Friday, April 22nd at 6.30, we're going to start, I'm calling it Jubilee Circle in Conversation, but we can, if anybody's got a catchier name, please let me know. But this is sort of a placeholder, uh, so this will be the first in our series of conversations. We're going to host these on the third Friday of each month, uh, so starting at 6.30, our first guest will be Holly Emore, and she is going to discuss paganism with us. And so, again, we're going to do this like a potluck and learn. Uh, we'll provide, Jubilee will provide some main dishes, and if you will bring just some side dishes. And again, that's not mandatory. If you can't bring anything, just come and enjoy and eat. There will be plenty, plenty for everyone. Uh, Friday, April 1st, uh, next Friday, is our uh, coffee house and open mic. Jeff and, Greg Jeff and Kelly Gregory from The Runout will be here. They start at 7. Great. Open mic starts at 8. Again, 
meal, food is served. <laughs> so uh, come and enjoy the, the open mic. We got lots of things going yes. on. April's getting busy. Oh, huh? We eat a lot here at Jubilee Circle. We love to eat, so come and eat with us. We eat frequently, not a lot. Yeah, well, we eat frequently. <laughs> Uh, Course in Miracles group is, as always, Wednesday, 7.30, um, and Soundy School at 10.30 on Sunday. Um, and uh, I did want to, to put out there uh, to everyone, uh, we are in search of at least two new board members. If folks want to uh, come and be a part of our directing committee, um, uh, uh, Jim had to, to resign. He had, it felt like he had some conflict of interest going on, so... Uh, so we're very sad to lose Jim, but we're, su we're glad he's still uh, putting us out live. Uh, we appreciate all of the uh, contributions that Jim makes to Jubilee Circle, but he has decided to step aside. And uh, so that creates two open positions on our board. Jim held two positions. <laughs> Jim held two positions. He did. That's how powerful he was. <laughs> we had someone else leave earlier, and we just hadn't replaced. So we ended up with like two. So now it's sort of imperative that we, that we get a couple of more people on board. If you're interested, there, it's not like a strenuous, incredible, incredibly strenuous job. Uh, we meet once a month, and we've, we've, we've got our meetings down to where we're not going for three hours, and there's usually food. So again, you know, so nobody's hangry while they're trying to make decisions. So <laughs> if you're interested, please let me know. Um, or talk to any of the other board members, which would be Julie. Um, Todd's back there. Yay. Um, who are my other? Is that my only board members here today? Or am I forgetting somebody? Okay. Yeah, Lee's not here. so He's the president of the board. So, yeah. So, if anybody's interested, please talk to me or talk to one of the board members. Uh, let's see. Oh, there was something else that I didn't write down. Oh, surely I'll remember it. Nope. <laughs> Gone. Okay. Well, <laughs> so did you want to uh, hear these wise and holy words? <laughs> we have a different wise and holy woman this morning. <laughs> oh, there's a ding somewhere. Ding. Our dingers are gone. Somewhere. There, there they are. <laughs> Back there with the dingaling. <laughs> My dingaling. All right. <laughs> hear these. Hear these wise, you got to get up on it to be heard. So hear these wise and holy words. With my teacher voice. Yeah, okay, go for it. From A Course in Miracles, Chapter 11. You're right. <laughs> if I live in you, you are awake. Yet you must see the works I do through you, or you will not perceive that I have done them unto you. Do not set limits on what you believe I can do through you, or you will not accept what I can do for you. Yet it is done already, and unless you give all that you have received, you will not know that your Redeemer liveth and that you have awakened with him. Redemption is recognized only by sharing it. God's child is saved. Bring only this awareness to the sonship and you will have a part in the redemption as valuable as mine. For your part must be like mine if you learn it of me. If you believe that yours is limited, you are limiting mine. There is no order of difficulty in miracles because all of God's children are of equal value and their equality is their oneness. The whole power of God is in every part of him and nothing contradictory to his will is either great or small. What does not exist has no size and no measure. To God, all things are possible. From Catholic mystic, Richard Rohr's book, The Divine Dance, Exploring the Mystery of Trinity. Many of us, consciously or unconsciously, have pictured God and reality as a pyramid-shaped universe. We place the male God at the top of the triangle and everything else beneath. Most Christian art, church design, and architecture reflects this pyramidal worldview. Humanity's capacity to disguise its own flaws, even through religion, seems endless. Pyramid or patriarchal logic is only logical when applied in favor of the system and the status quo, which it proudly calls the real world. Our very inability to recognize that shows how little influence the dynamic God had on our historical ways of thinking. We truly have nothing to be afraid of. The flow of God's love is like the rise and fall of tides on a shore. In this universe, reality can be pictured as an infinite, loving outpouring that empowers and generates an eternal, loving enfolding. This eternal flow outward is echoed in history by every animal, fish, 
flower, bird, and planet you have ever seen. It is the universe, the first incarnation of God. All we have to lose are the false images of God that do not serve us and are too small. And from the Christian mystic, Meister Eckhart, how long will grown men and women in this world keep drawing in their coloring books an image of God that makes them sad? It is a lie. Any talk of God that does not comfort you. These are wise and holy words. Thanks be to the holy. All creation is holy word. All creation speaks volumes of the holy. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I invite you during this time of meditation and reflection to think about how we see God. Right now, I'm looking at God. I am. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. God loves everyone. Yes. We, that's the dyslexic lays awake all, all night, think, wondering if there really is a dog. <laughs> but I invite you. It's hard in this world to walk around and see God in the eyes of everyone who looks back at you. It's difficult. Because there are some people that we say can't be God. Not that person. Not that person who wronged me. Not that person who slighted me. Not that person who hates me. They can't be God. But they are. They all are. Mother Teresa said that she often sees God in all her distressing disguises. And that's what it's like to walk around in this world. I often have uh, talked about the Walmart challenge because everybody wants to go to Walmart, but nobody wants to be there. <laughs> 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 so you're in Walmart, and everybody's an obstacle. There's three people in the lane you want to be in. Oh, there's one checkout person, <laughs> and, and the line is way back, and you're like, this, this surely, this surely must be hell. This <laughs> is what it's like. But nobody wants to go now, yeah. <laughs> exactly, right, right. But you know what? Walmart is heaven. It is. If you choose to see it, it is heaven. I, ch I, often ch I don't go to Walmart anymore, but I often challenge myself when I went to Walmart, so I just do it in other stores now, to not see anyone as an obstacle, to walk through a store and see everyone as God. That everyone, everyone is just having their own challenges. They're learning their own curriculum. They're doing everything they can in the best way they know how. And if we walk around and go, oh, Jesus, there you are again. <laughs> there you are, blocking my lane. Oh, Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you, God, stopping up the lane. <coughs> one, of the th one of my favorite things to do in the grocery store is to try to rush ahead of somebody who's got one or two items so I can let them in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> so I can go, you only got a few. Come on, man, that just makes me feel good. And then I'm just like, three more people. Come on, come on. <laughs> God, let God in front of you. Oh, God. <laughs> There you are again. Oh, God, there you go again. So many things. So I invite you. I invite you in this time. Meditate on maybe some of the most distressing faces of God you've ever seen because they're in your head. You know. You know who they are. But we're always invited to look deeper. Everybody's up here living on the surface, putting their ego out first because they think that's going to protect them. But we have the ability to see them, to see who they truly are, to see their love, to see their compassion, to see their struggles. And compassion just simply means to struggle with. It means to feel the suffering of others. And if we can walk around in that space that says, I see you, I see your struggle, I struggle too, we're all one. 
And if we recognize that, then our struggle eases, our suffering eases, and so does theirs. Breathe deeply. <sighs> oh, yeah. All right, our song this morning comes from a California based group called Dishwalla. I think this was the only hit they had. <laughs> it's called Counting Blue Cars, and it comes from their 1995 release, Pet Your Friends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the things they, they call albums. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four. a lot of interesting things about God, that he was an old man in the sky, and that he, much like Santa Claus, knew when I was sleeping, knew when I was awake, whether I had been bad or good, so it'd be good, for goodness sake, and because you don't want to go to hell. <laughs> As we age, our ideas and images of God tend to change. I mean, there are many of us who just go ahead like my sisters, you just go ahead and harden those ideas about a daddy God that watches over you and takes care of all the things. There are others, though, who broaden their ideas about God, and then there are others who just ditch God altogether, just can't even wrap their mind around why to believe in such a thing in the first place. Sometimes, though, it's nice to ask others to tell you all they know about God, especially if those others our children. Author Monica Parker compiled some responses from children on how they see God in her book called OMG, How Children See God. Five-year-old Piper said of God, God can grow you and he can dance, but he cannot type. 
I would argue differently because God does type through me sometimes, I think. It just feels very inspired. So maybe God physically can't type, but God can type through us. Eight-year-old Jacob said, God cannot create the earth because scientists discovered something about the Big Bang a few months ago. <laughs> All right. Seven-year-old Remy said, God lives inside of every living thing, so my doctor has seen God when he cuts people open. Ten-year-old Sadie said, I like to think that when it rains, God's taking a shower. <laughs> and thunder and lightning must just be when God's singing in the shower. <laughs> the wisest insight, though, I think came from a four-year-old who was aptly named Solomon. He said, God makes light and dark. He makes people and animals. He makes stars shine and makes people do good things. Except, Solomon said, the God in my head makes me do bad things. Maybe I should get a nicer God in my head. And that jubilance, I think, is the whole reason all of us are here in this bodily experience to remember that we all need a nicer God in our heads. We've all grown up with images of God that, as Meister Eckhart observed, make us sad. We've been told that God is all loving, but at the same time, it's a God that's going to send you to hell for all eternity if you slip up and do something on that list of no-nos that some religion or other has compiled and attributed to God. According to A Course in Miracles, we believe in this punishing, wrathful God because we feel guilty for believing in the tiny mad idea that is separation. We believe we deserve to be punished because we separated ourselves from God. In our belief that we caused the separation and offended God, we set up in this bodily world these harsh religious systems that remind us of how sinful and terrible we are and that no matter how good we are, it's only through God sacrificing his son that he can even bear to look at our awful faces ever again, let alone forgive us. Anybody grow up like that? How ridiculous. That line of thinking, of course, it just leads to self-flagellation. It leads to shame. It leads to blame. It leads to guilt. We create religions with winners and losers, the saved and the damned, and we convince ourselves that our belief system, we got it right. Everybody else got it wrong. So we invent gods that keep us passive, that teach us blind obedience, that abhors questions and demands that we simply trust and obey. For there's no other way. We often build our religious world in the way that Catholic priest and mystic Richard Rohr describes as that pyramid-shaped universe with that stern, always male, God at the top of the triangle and everything else beneath. Humanity's capacity to disguise its own flaws even through religion seems endless, Rohr says. Pyramid or patriarchal logic is only logical when applied in favor of the system and the status quo, which it proudly calls the real world. Our very inability to recognize that shows how little influence the dynamic God has had on our historical ways of thinking. Solomon is right. We need a nicer God in our head. And the good news, though, jubilance, is that nicer God already exists, and it's already in your head. Remy is also right that God is in every living thing, but we build barriers to God because we've allowed the ego to do such a good job at convincing us that we're all sinners in the hands of some angry God. So what happens when we believe in this world's wrathful and controlling gods? Well, according to a study that was done last year, if we believe in a God we just simply obey, and that's it, that's what you got to do, old, good, old, good old Uncle George, we get less creative. Researchers had people think about God before doing a task that required them to think creatively to solve it, and they found that those who believed in a monotheistic God were less creative than those who didn't. But it's important to know, though, what believers thought about when they thought about God. The participants, according to the researchers, generated a multifaceted image of God, including elements such as him being omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, benevolent, and the creator of the world. 
And of course, it's interesting to note that the researchers themselves use the pronoun him when they refer to the study subjects' images of God which, you know, it could be their own bias, but it may be indicative, too, of the kind of God that these subjects in the experiment were thinking of, specifically that male one that sits on top of Rohr's pyramid and keeps us all in line with the egoic world's status quo of obedience. So how do we break down this barrier of these gods that make us less creative and more apt to accept the world we see instead of the world we wish to create? In a word, we have to reclaim our creativity. Breathe deeply. Two, three, four. is this. Those who conceived of God as omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, benevolent, and the creator of the world slipped into a passive mindset. They expect God to just handle everything and demand nothing from them. However, the researchers also found that those who view God as unconditionally loving, forgiving, and as a source of creativity, or that God works through them to unveil his creations, this, they say, may be compatible with creative expression. So now, we're on to something big. Our ideas about God are no longer a barrier when we realize we've been duped by the ego's ideas about God as some vending machine where prayer goes in and stuff comes out, or as an insurance policy against burning for eternity in some manner of fiery hell down there in good old Uncle George's basement. The ego's views of God, the ego's views of God make us passive and uncreative. Seeing God for who and what it really is, that unitive force in the universe, helps us to realize we are not passive observers, but we are proactive co-creators with God, here to actively take part in our own awakening and subsequently the awakening of the whole world. As A Course in Miracles reminds us, God can only act in this world through us. We miscreate in this world when we expect the angry and spiteful gods of the ego to guide us. If we want to see, if we want to see what miscreation looks like, take a peek at the news. Yep. Take a peek at Facebook. See how many wars and pogroms and crusades we have all made against each other in the past and right now in God's name. Violence, tribalism, fear, and division, jubilance, it is never created. None of it. In this state, we limit the power of God to work through us to bring love and peace and joy into the world. There is no order of difficulty in miracles, our reading from A Course says, because all of God's children are of equal value, and their equality is their oneness. 
all of God's children are of equal value. There is equality in our oneness. The whole power of God is in every part of God, of course says, and nothing contradictory to God's will is either great or small. To God, all things are possible. And God works through us. To the gods of this world that we have created, all things become impossible. Again, check the news. How impossible it all seems. Because all we can do through these little ten gods is to miscreate and bring about more suffering and separation. So when we break down the barrier of this false ego created God, Rohr says we learn there's nothing to be afraid of. The flow of God's love, he says, is like the rise and fall of tides on a shore. In this universe, reality can be pictured as an infinite loving outpouring that empowers and generates an eternal loving enfolding. This eternal flow outward is echoed in history by every animal, fish, flower, bird, and planet you have ever seen, Roar says. It is the universe, the first incarnation of God. All we have to lose are the false images of God that do not serve us and are too small. Or as Solomon in his wisdom says, Maybe I should get a nicer God in my head. And jubilance, if we do that, if we get in touch with the nicer God that is already alive within us, we become more creative. Because we understand we are the same as God, which means we can create miracles. We can be the change we want to see in this world. We can use the power of love and joy and kindness and wonder and beauty and unity to create that within ourselves, which then we can project out into the world and create that world there. And when we realize, as Meister Eckhart says, that it is a lie, any talk of God that does not comfort you, then we will immediately abandon the wrathful gods of the ego that limits our creativity in this world and instead embrace the innate divinity that we have as our higher divine self that seeks to create only peace, only love, only joy and unity in every moment because we remember who we are. We are that open channel for God's light of love to shine through us into this world. So the question for all of us this morning, jubilance, what are your thoughts on God about? Do you see that male at the top of the pyramid? That omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, benevolent creator of the world that demands you toe the line or be eternally damned? Or do you envision an unconditionally loving and forgiving God that seeks to co-create in joy and love and peace through you into this world. If it's the latter, well, there's good news from a five-year-old named Ben. He has the key to help us see that creative, loving God everywhere we go. Ben's mother, Holly Leibowitz Rossi, writes about what happened when Ben wanted to know if we could see God. And Rossi writes... When we asked our rabbi about it, he replied that he believes he sees God when he looks into the eyes of other people. And Ben loved this explanation, she writes, and he has repeated it to others. During a recent visit, our close friend's three-year-old came up to me after speaking with Ben. She put her hands on my cheeks. She looked deeply into my eyes and said, I see God. This jubilant is a reminder that we are not passive participants in this world. We are not waiting for some God to swoop down and save us. We are the ones that we have been waiting for. We are all God walking around in flesh suits, forgetting and remembering who we truly are. We are all God embodied, seeking to awaken to that one singular truth about us all. Far from making us less creative, this is the knowledge that will spur us to be constantly creating, constantly creating anything that brings more love and joy and peace 
and compassion to this world. Because when we can see God in the eyes of everyone we meet, even in Walmart, we can see the infinite power that lies within each of us just waiting to be called forth to awaken ourselves and the whole world. It is in that moment when you truly peer into the eyes of another and there you see God. This barrier to love will crumble as we swap that wrathful egoic God in our heads for the nicer one that will make the whole world say, Oh, yeah. yeah. Two, three, four. <laughs>
So uh, there are many, many ways that you can help us. And again, uh, there are lots of no-cost ways you can help us by sharing our stuff on social media, telling your friends about Jubilee Circle. Fran did that uh, beautifully. Uh, fr oh, actually, Reva did that <laughs> beautifully. Yeah, she's amazing. See, unlike, unlike God, Reva can type. So she's amazing. Uh, and <laughs> so we have all, babies and dogs. I mean, you can't get better than babies and dogs. So we're going to say goodbye to you, all of y'all out there uh, watching us virtually. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Remember, as Meister Eckhart says, if the only prayer you ever say your entire life is thank you, it will be enough because when you are in that place of gratitude, there is nothing lacking. And that God that you understand is that creative force in this universe because that's, that is the source of all gratitude. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. And we will see you again, same bat time, same bat channel, next Sunday. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.